Greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute. My name is Michael Le Chevalier and I am Associate Director of the Institute. Lumen Christi was founded by scholars, Catholic scholars at the University of Chicago in 1997. And our mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition in its depth and breadth, a living dialogue partner at the University of Chicago in our broad, and in our broader society through courses, lectures, summer seminars for graduate and undergraduate event, um, students and virtual events like these. As you may have already noticed, um, today's event is being made more accessible to viewers through two separate means. Um, first, at the bottom of your screen, next to the Q&A button, there is a CC um, line in which you can uh, add either subtitles or view a full transcript on the right side of the screen. We are also joined by two expert um, American Sign Language interpreters today, Jenna Jasek and Nancy Sullivan. I want to highlight three upcoming events that we have coming forward today. Um, on Thursday, we continue our programming in economics and Catholic social thought uh, with a program on automation and the future of work, insights from economics and Catholic social thought. This coming Saturday, we have an event entitled United by Their Loves, Deciphering Augustine's Understanding of a People, featuring Jennifer Frey, Russell Hittinger, and Father Michael Sherwin. And finally, this series continues next week with a program entitled Latino Youth and Evangelization, featuring Claudia Herrera and Jose Matos Alfon. Today's event continues our Hispanic theology series, a part of our ongoing commitment to present the depths and breadths of the Catholic intellectual tradition in all its variety. This whole series will be recorded and posted to YouTube. And I encourage you to share it today with colleagues and friends who are unable to participate in this evening's event. This series is made possible by a generous grant from the Our Sunday Visitor Institute and co-sponsored by ACTUS or the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the US, La Comunidad of Hispanic Scholars of Religion, Corazon Puro, the Collegium Institute, the Hispanic Theological Initiative, the St. Benedict Institute, the Nova Forum, Calvert House Catholic Cam um, Campus Ministry, Dominican University Ministry Program, the Ecclesia America Network, the Hank Center for Catholic Intellectual Heritage, the Oscar Romero Scholars Program at Catholic Theological Union, Iscali, Commonweal Magazine, American Media, and especially we are grateful today for the co-sponsorship by the National Catholic Partnership on Disability, who have made possible the accessibility that we're offering for this evening's event. I'm grateful for these many institutions that have helped ensure today's, the success of today's event. Now you too can help support us in three different ways. First, you can join our mailing list and share word about these events with others. Word of mouth or sign remains the most effective means of inviting others into the Catholic intellectual tradition. At the end of the event, you'll be invited to participate in a survey that will help us to gauge what we're doing right and wrong in our programming. Filling it out, you'll enter a raffle to win a gift card from our favorite local independent bookstore, the Seminary Co-op. Finally, you can support us financially today by donating at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate to help us get to continue to offer programs like these for free to viewers like you. During today's event, there'll be an opportunity for questions from the audience. You can, however, post questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of our screen. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will also be giving voice to various audience members to ask questions and we'll be communicating with you through chat to invite you to do so after you post your question. I now have the pleasure of introducing today's moderator who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Peter Casarella is professor of theology at Duke Divinity School. Casarella has served as president of the American Cusano Society, the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Scholars of the US and the Academy of Catholic Theologians. He's also a longtime friend and collaborator with the Institute and a key partner in organizing this series. Peter, I invite you to take it away. Buenas noches. Good evening to all. It's so nice to have you here. I wanna welcome those who are here for the first time and welcome back those who have been ongoing partners 
in our Hispanic Theology series. We have a very special program tonight. We're going to think about the relationship between Hispanic wisdom and its entanglements or interweavings in the Catholic intellectual tradition. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Miguel Romero. Dr. Romero is an assistant professor in the Department of Religion and Theological Studies at Salve Regina University and has served there since 2016. Equally important, he's contributed his services as board member to the aforementioned National Catholic Partnership on Disability. Before arriving at Salve, Dr. Romero had multiple postdoctoral fellowships and adjunct teaching positions at the University of Notre Dame. His curriculum vitae is very long. Let me just, for the sake of time, mention two or three items that are of special interest in terms of tonight's talk. He's working on a forthcoming manuscript with the University of Notre Dame Press that's entitled The Destiny of the Wounded Creature, St. Thomas on Disability. Prior to that, he published in the book, Disability in Medieval Philosophy and Theology, an essay very closely related to tonight's topic entitled Disappearance of a Medieval Account of Persons Who Lack the Use of Reason. And also in the journal, The Thomist, Happiness and Those Who Lack the Use of Reason, which appeared in 2016. On a somewhat personal note, I first became aware of the scholarship of Miguel Romero around 2008, when I was serving on the then um, interviewing committee of the Hispanic Theological Initiative, one of our co-sponsors tonight. And I read an application from an incoming doctoral student to Duke Divinity School that said that this man, Miguel Romero, had great promise. So I introduce you tonight, a scholar who's achieved uh, great things in the area of disability studies, the study of Thomas Aquinas and the whole Catholic intellectual tradition, but also very proudly um, one of the greatest achievements of the Hispanic Theological Initiative Mentoring Program. Miguel is going to speak tonight on Was Something Lost? Thomas Aquinas, Intellectual Disability in the 16th Century Spanish Colonial Debates. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Miguel Romero. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Peter, for that warm introduction, <clears throat> and thank you also uh, for all the all the sponsors and all the folks whose efforts uh, came together to make um, to make this possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to tell you a story, uh, uh, and it begins like this: at the end of the Middle Ages and the beginnings of modernity, there was a subtle shift in the way the Spanish Dominican interpreters of Thomas Aquinas spoke about the significance of our rational faculties. So tonight I'm gonna to be describing a set of historical and textual markers that indicate both the origin and the development of that interpretive shift. So these markers are found amid a whirlwind of questions that were fiercely debated throughout Spain during the first half of the 16th century. So my overarching concern is what happened in the 16th century to Aquinas's 13th century way of thinking about the vulnerability of our rational faculties. In particular, what happened to Aquinas's account of persons who lack the use of reason? what we today might call persons who have a moderate to profound intellectual disability or cognitive impairment. So this is a summary account of how I think Aquinas's way of thinking about such persons came to be displaced from the main currents of the Thomistic theological tradition. So just a bit of background, I'm bringing to this talk uh, three exegetical judgments about Aquinas's understanding of the human being, which I've developed elsewhere. Um, one, of the, or, one of them was an article that, uh, that Peter mentioned in the Thomist. So here's these three. Uh, number one, Aquinas's view that our vulnerability to impairment, illness, and injury, that this is integral to human nature and co coincides with the, the dignity 
of the human being as the image of God. Uh, number two, Aquinas' distinction between the specifying act of the intellect and the derivative intellectual act called the use of reason. And three, Aquinas' understanding of the inalienable intellectual nature and contemplative aptitude of every human being, including persons who lack the use of reason. So in light of those judgments about the content of Aquinas' anthropological outlook, the 16th century questions and debates that interest me here concern the legitimacy of the Spanish colonial enterprise in the Americas, and they focus on the rational status and moral aptitude of the Amerindian peoples. So straight from the outset, a Im very important distinction needs to be made crystal clear between the specific topic of the Spanish colonial debates and the more general theoretical subject of those debates. So on the one hand, the specific topic of the Spanish colonial debates were the allegations about the rational status and moral aptitude of the American Indian people. Uh, and by extension, the justice or injustice of the Spanish colonial enterprise in the Americas. So on the other hand, the, the more general subject of the Spanish colonial debates was the anthropological status and moral aptitude of persons who seem to lack the use of reason. So bearing in mind the distinction between the topic and the subject of the Spanish colonial debates, my main interest here is persons who actually and not allegedly lack the use of reason. So in those debates, key philosophical and theological arguments uh, were deployed. Uh, and, and they were deployed in a way where those debates, they hinged on a correct interpretation and application of the theology of Thomas Aquinas and the philosophy of Aristotle. Now, when we look at those 16th century engagements and when we compare them to the relevant texts from uh, Aquinas and Aristotle, important points of consistency and inconsistency, inconsistency become apparent. Now, what one finds is Spanish colonial interests twisting what Aquinas and Aristotle say about persons who actually lack the use of reason, and then maliciously applying those twisted formulations to the Amerindian peoples. And then one finds the vehement response, the energetic response from the Dominican Thomists of Salamanca, a moral argument decrying the ugly abuses and exploitations of the Amerindian peoples, a philosophical rejection of the twisted colonialist theories, and third, a theological uncertainty about what to do with the descriptions of persons who lack the use of reason that we find in the thought of Aquinas. So the aspect of the debates that I want to focus on could be mapped in relationship to one theologically problematic premise. Specifically, the presumption that posits a direct correlation between human dignity and the use of reason. That presumption is inconsistent with the anthropological and moral outlook of St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, as it turns out, that problematic premise was also one of the cornerstones of the Dominican defense of the Amerindians. Unfortunately, in adopting this strategy, the Dominican Thomists, Dominican Thomists like Bartolome de las Casas, servant of God Bartolome de las Casas, they appropriated subtle theological imprecisions that are serious, that are difficult to recognize, but have far reaching implications. And this is evident, for example, when Las Casas claims in his defense of the Indians that persons who, quote, lack the use of reason, as they are occasionally to be found, are freaks, are, quote, freaks of a rational nature who cannot seek God, know God, call upon him or love him, end quote. Now, by contrast, in the writings of Francisco de Vitoria, likewise composed in defense of the Amerindian peoples, we find the remnants of a Thomistic outlook on persons who lack the use of reason that may be worth recovering. So as a teaser for those who are familiar with these debates, I think this solves uh, an important mystery about the eighth title of Vitoria's De Indies. And I'll talk about that towards the end. And I'm interested in getting feedback on that about what y'all think. So 
mapping Miguel, is going... before you continue, can I just ask a moment? We're going to try and resolve our issue of having um, everyone be able to view ASL interpreters and you at the same time. So to all of our participants at the top right of, your, of each speaker's box, you'll see three dots. And there you can click and put a pin on both speakers. That will enable you to both see Jenna at this time and Miguel. Um, I understand that uh, if that's not the case, well, I'm, I, I'm not able to understand what's going on. Otherwise, oh. I can also try and spotlight uh, um, Jenna for everyone. Um, And are our audience members able to see Miguel at this time as well? Um, using the Q&A section, if you could indicate whether Miguel is visible to our audience. Um, can you hear me, Michael? Yes. This is Nancy. I, apparently you can only pin one person at a time. At least that's all I can do. And right now, Jenna, I have it on speaker view and Michael and um, Dr. Romero is large and the interpreter is small. If I click on gallery view, then you see all of the panelists squares the but same for our size. Viewers, they should only be able to see um, whoever has a video on at this time. Okay. I just, um, not, I'm not understanding why the spotlight's on, but uh, anyway, okay. Um, people can pin us one at a time. It'd be one or the other, I think. I unfortunately think that people will have to do individual pinning as audience members to be able to view um, multiple um, uh, to, be able, to be able to view multiple speakers. All right, Miguel, I think that uh, uh, we'll continue as is. And please communicate through the, the question box if you're unable to see things. Great. Uh, thank you for that. You know, one of the things I love about working, uh, uh, doing this kind of work, and especially one of the things I've come to learn and appreciate in a new way through the National Catholic Partnership on Disability, is that when uh, a certain kind of gift arises, uh, when we need to pause, uh, uh, we get, we're get made family in a new way when we need to make space and make time and uh, attend to uh, those who, uh, to make sure our community is open for everybody and the conversation is open for everybody. So for those who are concerned about this, I am grateful. Thank you for making us family. Thank you for making us familia. This is good. It makes it better. Um, so to pick up where, uh, uh, where, I, where I left off. So as a teaser, uh, for those of you who are familiar, I think uh, part of what I'm going to be describing tonight solves an important mystery about the eighth title of Vitorias de Indies, and I'll, I'll talk about that at the end. So uh, mapping the Spanish colonial debates through the problematic grounding of human dignity uh, in the use of reason, it provides a bird's eye view of how the specific topic of the debates relates to the more general theological subject of the debates. However, it doesn't tell us something important. It doesn't tell us the story of what happened and, and how it happened. That story requires that we retrace familiar historical and textual markers, but that we do so in a way that remembers persons we often forget because their presence in history is easy to overlook. As the Dominican Thomists of Salamanca made their worthy arguments in defense of the Amerindian peoples, Many of them did not remember what Aquinas had to say about persons who lack the use of reason, persons who are often overlooked, ignored, and forgotten. So I'm going to admit from the outset that this is a complex story, and there's, there's a lot of move, moving pieces. And what I want to do is I want to give a brief peek into why understanding these connections, these connections is important for scholars who are focused on Latin medieval philosophy and theology. And in addition to that, I want to show why these connections are important for contemporary interpreters of Aquinas, especially those who, like, like me, recognize the outlook of St. Thomas as a valuable resource for the enrichment of contemporary Christian reflection and contemporary Christian discourse. So 
to begin, the Spanish colonial debates. So the story of the Spanish colonial debates unfolds during the decades following the first European encounters with the various civilizations and people groups of the Americas. Now, anyone with more than a passing interest in the history of Western philosophy and theology will be familiar with the key points of disputation during that period in Spain. So among the most prominent questions were like this, um, what is the nature and rational status of the Amerindian peoples? If the Amerindians lack the use of reason, do they likewise lack the capacity for intellectual development, moral virtue, and Christian holiness? And in relating to the Amerindians, what does justice require of the Spanish and what does justice permit? So arising from those questions, the story that most of us learned in high school, it goes like this. From 1492 to the middle part of the 16th century, Spanish philosophers, theologians, jurists, missionaries, scholars, and academics of all stripes, they brought the titanic conceptual and analytic resources of the European Middle Ages to bear on an unprecedented set of encounters, conflicting interests, inconsistent reports, and sickening justifications of profoundly unjust behavior. Now, advocates of the Spanish colonial enterprise argued, among other things, that the, that the Amerindians were, on the whole, were congenitally subordinate, quasi-irrational, beast-like humans, rendered insane by poor climate and immoral cultural practices. Now, the centerpiece of the colonialist rationale was a novel interpretation of Aristotle's Fusidulon figure. Uh, this is, uh, that's the Greek for Sidulon, uh, translated the natural slave or the slave by nature. It could also be translated as uh, the natural servant. Now, the first time that, that novel interpretation was articulated and applied to the Amerindian peoples was by the Scottish theologian John Mayer in 1510. And he does this in his commentary on, uh, on the sentences uh, on book two. Distinction 44, book two of the sentences. So Mayer's exegetically problematic formulation of the natural slave was conflated with circumstances and conditions that Aristotle was careful to keep distinct. What emerged from Mayer's interpretation in the arguments of the colonialists at the Burjos Junta of 1512 was a composite caricature that had the condition of Aristotle's natural slave the fixed strangeness of Aristotle's foreign barbarian, the social status of Aristotle's civil slave, the unruly passions of Aristotle's incontinent man, and the irrational wildness of Aristotle's account of the beast-like men from the folk legends and myths of ancient Greece. So given that caricature of the nature and status of the Amerindian peoples, it was presumed by Spanish colonialists that the Amerindians as a group had little potential for intellectual and moral and spiritual development. Thus it was argued, justice required very little of the Spanish in the Americas and much was permitted. Now, in the vehement opposition to the advocates of the Spanish colonial enterprise, Dominican theologians and missionaries associated with the school of Salamanca forcefully rejected the claim that the Amerindians lacked the use of reason or that their lives resembled anything like the caricature that was attributed to them. These scholars held forth concrete evidence of the rational nature and moral aptitude of the Amerindians. And in doing so, these Thomists carried out a monumental and historically consequential and decades long defense of the rationality, human dignity and human rights of the Amerindian peoples. Dominicans like uh, Bartolome de las Casas, for example, made arguments rooted, rooted in the complexity of the Amerindian understanding of the natural world. They highlighted the contemplative end and devotional rationale of the various Amerindian religious practices. And they brought to light the principled civility of the unfamiliar Amerindian social mores. Now, because it could be demonstrated empirically and argued theologically, that the Amerindians on the whole possessed the rational nature of the human species, there was no reason to doubt that the Amerindian peoples likewise possess the requisite faculties for intellectual development, moral virtue, and Christian holiness. For those reasons, the Salamancans argued 
Justice required much of the Spanish in the Americas and justice imposed radical constraints on what was permitted. So given that standard narrative, our contemporary historical judgment concerning what is most significant and most consequential about the Spanish colonial debates is liable to uncritically appropriate at least three interpretive errors. Now, these errors came to be firmly embedded in the discourse and the 16th century interlocutors on both sides. Namely, the view that John Mayer's interpretation of book one of the politics was accurate. Two, uh, that the 16th century application of Mayer's interpretation to the Amer Indians was consistent with what Aristotle was describing. And three, the view that Aquinas taught that the use of reason is what specifies human nature, and that the use of reason is the principle of our creaturely dignity as the image of God. So I'm going to treat those three interpretive errors in turn. Um, so to begin with, let's talk about Aristotle. In particular, Aristotle on natural slavery. So a large part of what I have to say about the 16th century hangs on how we interpret book one of Aristotle's politics. In particular, uh, distinguishing be between the imprecise contemporary view and what Aristotle actually says. However, I, I, what, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I, I would enjoy, I'm sure some folks would enjoy it. I'm not going to walk us through a close reading of the politics tonight. Um, fortunately, the key exege exegetical judgments are they're fairly uncontroversial among Aristotle scholars and specialists who've looked closely at the relevant sections in Aristotle's thought. Whatever controversy there is, it arises when contemporary interpreters uh, project the 16th century theory of natural slavery onto, a, uh, onto Aristotle. So as just mentioned, that 16th century theory was invented by John Mayer and was promoted by the 16th century Spanish colonialists. So I'm happy to talk about Aristotle uh, during the Q&A. Uh, for now, uh, I'll summarize the key points from Aristotle that are most important to understanding what happened in the 16th century. So three basic questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, how do we interpret that, that section uh, at the beginning of book one of the politics? And I'm sure you all know what I mean when I say that section. Uh, that section where Aristotle quotes the line from Euripides, which says, quote, it is proper that Greeks should rule the non-Greeks, which Aristotle then interprets to be claiming that, quote, the barbarian and the slave are by nature identical, end quote. So the key terms here are uh, barbaroi, uh, roughly a non-Greek foreigner, and fusidulon, the natural servant or the natural slave. So what do we do with that section at the beginning of book one of the politics? So the common misreading is that Aristotle is making a metaphysically stipulative claim about the essential nature of non-Greeks and slaves. That is to say that all non-Greeks are essentially slaves and can be enslaved against their will. However, against that, a straightforward and careful reading of that line in its immediate context uh, and in, in light of the conclusions of book one, they show the error of that interpretation. Basically, what Aristotle does, he uses that line from Euripides at the beginning as a rhetorical foil in an argument to establish the essential naturalness of the condition of the natural slave, which Aristotle contrasts with the accidental unnaturalness of the condition of the barbarian non-Greek. So to see this, all you got to do is read the conclusion of Aristotle's natural slave discourse, where he explicitly and unambiguously returns to that exact quote, and then explains why it's nonsense to claim that all non-Greeks are natural slaves. According to Aristotle, the condition of the natural slave is due to an essential defect, something essential to the form of that being. So the second question. According to Aristotle, what exactly is wrong with non-Greeks? So based on the common misreading of the line that I just mentioned, uh, it's inaccurately presumed that according to Aristotle, all non-Greeks should be enslaved because they have some essential defect. Now against that misreading, 
a straightforward systematic reading of all the places where Aristotle discusses the difference between Greeks and non-Greeks uh, shows something different. Specifically, Aristotle thinks that the climate and food of particular regions, they stimulate or depress the, the internal spirit or heat, uh, what he calls the thumos of the human being, T-H-U-M-O-S. Now, Aristotle theorizes that this internal thumos impacts the behavior of people who live in those regions. So too hot, you get an unnaturally brutish behavior. Too cold, and you get unnaturally slavish behavior. For Aristotle, the ideal climate for the ideal internal thumos is the Mediterranean region, Northern Africa, and of course, Greece. Now, the condition of the non-Greek barbarian according to Aristotle, is due to an accidental defect, which is caused by poor climate. So a third question about Aristotle, what exactly is wrong with the natural slave? So based on the common misreading just mentioned, the conflation of uh, non-Greek foreigners and natural slaves, based on that common misreading, the presumption is that Aristotle's natural slave discourse is a theoretical justification of something like the racialized chattel slavery of the modern era. Now, against that reading, uh, through a straightforward reading of Aristotle's entire discourse on natural slavery, there's a very strong case to be made that Aristotle is, in fact, attempting to describe persons who have what we today would call a moderate to severe intellectual disability or a cognitive impairment. Uh, this is the line taken by uh, Aristotle scholars like Trevor Saunders, uh, G. Scott Davis, Stephen Clark, among, and some others who take this interpretive line. Now, following that interpretive line, as Aristotle sees it, sometimes people are born in a condition that renders them incapable of self-governance and self-care. Given that ordinary happenstance, according to Aristotle, every good and mature head of household will eventually take in one or several natural servants and will forge a mutually beneficial relationship with them, which would involve protective care, it would involve appropriate expectations and a species of friendship. Now, to be clear, and I wanna be crystal clear about this, I am not advocating for Aristotle. His account of the naturalness of the natural slave's condition is for him, the natural phenomena he presupposes in the development of his rationale for the justice of civil slavery. Uh, and I'm not saying that Aristotle's account of persons who lack the use of reason is correct. I'm not saying that persons with intellectual disabilities should be enslaved, nor am I saying the relationship Aristotle describes uh, between the natural master and the natural slave is something that should be imitated. Aristotle was not envisioning an assisted a living group home or, or anything like large. Rather, my only claim, and this is the important part, is that Aristotle tried to think carefully about the natural basis, the significance, and the moral implications of the fact that some human beings are born with a condition that renders them incapable of ordinary self-care, ordinary self-governance. What he's, uh, The way he says it, they're able to participate in reason so as to apprehend it but not to possess it. So for Aristotle, the natural slave is an essentially defective human being. At the most basic level, what Aristotle is saying about people who have an intellectual disability is irreconcilable with the Christian account of the human being. So that's Aristotle. Now let's turn to the 13th century and St. Thomas Aquinas, and let's pick up the thread of this story. So Aquinas takes as his own the Christian presumption that every human being is a creature formed in the image and likeness of triune God. In Aquinas's subversive revision of Aristotle, Aquinas reconceives Aristotle's natural slave as a human being whose essential nature is uncompromised and who lacks the use of reason because of an accidental impairment. Now, the condition that Aquinas ordinarily associates with those who lack the use of reason is called amentia, A-M-E-N-T-I-A, -E which could be translated as mindlessness. Uh, and 
it comes up throughout Aquinas' works. Uh, it's roughly the same as what we today would refer to as an intellectual disability or a cognitive impairment. So just a quick note here on Aquinas' terminology. Uh, so to our contemporary ears, uh, mindlessness may seem like an offensive, an offensive way to describe the condition of a person. Well, it's always important to think about and at least understand or try to understand these kinds of terms in context. For example, to the ears of Aquinas and other scholastics, to say that someone has an intellectual disability would be equally horrific and offensive. Because for Aquinas, the essential activity of the human being, of the human intellect, is the one thing that cannot be disabled or defective in a human being. Our intellectual faculties are integral to our nature. It would be like saying, for Aquinas, it'd be like saying the person is essentially defective in the same way that Aristotle thought that the natural slave was essentially defective. We can also pause on that word defect or defectum. In our modern years, living in the wake of the industrial scale eugenic elimination of defective persons in the 20th century, that word defect is worrisome when applied to human beings, and rightly so. However, for Aquinas and other scholastics, a defectum, it simply means to, to lack an ability or an accidental quality. So given our, mar our modern baggage, it wouldn't really be a stretch to translate Aquinas's use of the word defectum as disability. And in fact, as it turns out, that's exactly what Father Liam Walsh uh, did, does. Uh, he's a Dominican priest. Uh, that's what he did in the 1973 English translation of questions seven through 15 of the Tertia Pars, the third part of the Summa. Specifically in the prologue to questions 14 and 15, where Aquinas discusses the defects connected with the incarnation. That is to say, the disabilities of body and of soul co-assumed by Christ at the incarnation. All right, so back to Aquinas. Central to Aquinas' understanding of the anthropological significance of conditions like Amentia is his judgment that the vulnerability of the human being to impairment, illness, and injury, that this is integral to human nature. It is consistent and it corresponds with the kind of beings that we are in the good order of God's creation. This vulnerability is connected to our, our inalienable dignity as human beings created in the image and likeness of God. So when it comes to conditions like amentia, the key to understanding conditions that impair the use of reason on Aquinas' terms is one distinction. And there's a lot of them, but this is one important one. First, that the specifying act of the intellect is not the same as the derivative intellectual act called the use of reason. The specifying act of the intellect makes us what we are. The derivative intellectual act called the use of reason is an extension of that. So for Aquinas, this distinction between the specifying act of the intellect and the act of reasoning, it's, it's really not that important when you're basically trying to define human nature, where are the differences between say a human being and brute animals. Uh, so for that reason, in, a, in Aquinas's discourse, Reason, the words like reason, intelligence, knowledge, understanding, or mind, they all belong to the same incorporeal operation called the power of intellect. Nevertheless, for Aquinas, the distinction between the act of the intellect and the use of reason is very important when the aspect of consideration is our perfection as intellectual creatures formed in the image in likeness of triune God. For Aquinas, the perfection of our intellectual nature by knowledge and by love is not reducible to the use of reason. Moreover, Aquinas explicitly affirms that every human being is capable of actual knowledge and actual love of God. And that includes, without ambiguity, persons who lack the use of reason. So that's the background on Aquinas. When he makes his commentary on Aristotle's politics in particular, uh, the first part of Aristotle's discourse on natural slavery, Aquinas begins with a, a short little reflection on the word barbaroi in book one. Aquinas focuses on that line from Euripides concerning non-Greeks and slaves. 
In Aquinas' remark, in, in his remark, uh, he indicates that it's possible to be confused about who exactly Aristotle has in mind when he's referring to these foreigners. Now, the subtlety of Aquinas' subversion of Aristotle's outlook is amazing. Uh, here's what he does. So, okay, so commenting upon the line from Euripides given in 1252b uh, uh, against Aristotle, Aquinas uses his Aristotle's revised interpretation of the Euripidean line going to the end. And then Aquinas draws upon Aristotle's earlier use of the word barbarian in the Nicomachean ethics. He takes those two together. Now, he does this to speculate on why the natural slave in book one of the politics might seem profoundly different or strange. So here's the move. Aquinas uses Aristotle against Aristotle. He uses Aristotle's individual scale thumos theory of regional differences. That's where, where uh, a climate affects the body. He uses that theory uh, to account for the condition of the natural slave. In other words, on Aristotle's terms, Aquinas shifts the condition of the natural slave from an essential defect to an accidental defect. Specifically, Aquinas argues that the natural slave, a, a person who lacks the use of reason, is accidentally impaired because of some external cause in the same way that Aristotle thinks the differences of regional climate can have an effect on the behavior of non-Greeks. So with this comparison of non-Greeks and those who lack the use of reason, Aquinas isn't raising a question about the humanity or the rationality of non-Greeks. Rather, Aquinas is using the unquestioned rationality of non-Greeks to eliminate any question about the humanity of the natural slave. In that way, Aquinas does something significant. He subverts Aristotle's rationalistic conception of human nature and of the human good, reframing the condition of those who lack the use of reason as a privation of a, of a relative corporeal good due to something external from the outside. And this is also important. By making this move, Aquinas rejects the anthropological judgments that are behind Aristotle's construal of the essential defect of the natural slave. And by doing that, Aristotle, um, Aquinas, completely undermines the foundation of Aristotle's rationale for the justice of civil slavery. That's Aquinas. So now we're getting closer to the key debates. <clears throat> In 1512, the Spanish King Ferdinand called for a gathering at Burjos in response to pressure from the Dominican order. Now, in the years leading up to that gathering, the, the Dominican order had been decrying the violence and injustices being inflicted upon the Amerindian peoples. And the Dominicans actively questioned the legitimacy of the Spanish colonial presence in the Americas. So Ferdinand called the meeting of Burjos to basically just settle the question. Now, as I said before, the first time Aristotle's account of the slave by nature, the first time it was invoked uh, during the Spanish colonial debates was at the Burjos Junta in 1512. So there is, there's a solid historical consensus that John Mayer inadvertently provided the core inspiration for what became the centerpiece of the Spanish colonialist rationale. Now in Mayer's commentary on Distinction 44, book two of the sentences, he takes up the question of whether or not it's legitimate for Christians to rule over pagans. Uh, and that's where this this gloss on, uh, on Aristotle's natural slave theory, this is where we find that. So I can say more about the many problems with Mayer's account, but I'll basically summarize it like this. Mayer's, John Mayer's novel account of the natural slave, it bears only a superficial resemblance to what we actually find in book one of the politics. In fact, the plain sense of Aristotle's extended account uh, in that section of the politics is a systematic deconstruction of the kinds of imprecisions that characterize John Mayer's 16th century gloss, his theory of natural slavery. John Mayer's account of natural slavery, it eventually set the template for the Spanish colonialist arguments, specifically the arguments spanning from the Burjos Junta of 1512 to the arguments of Juan Guinness de Sepulveda at Valladolid in 1550. So here, here's the story. 
Here's the story of how, in the 16th century, Aquinas' way of thinking about persons who lack the use of reason, how it came to be displaced from the mores of, the, of, of Thomistic theological discourse. In defense of the American Indian peoples and against the Spanish colonialist arguments, the Dominican Thomists of Salamanca, they rejected the, colon, the colonialist use of Aristotle and the appeal to Aquinas. The Dominican defense of the humanity of the Amerindian Indian peoples, this was a good thing. It should be regarded as one of the great achievements of Salamancan Thomism. Unfortunately, the circumstances that led the Salamancan Thomists, like, like Las Casas, uh, uh, unfortunately, the circumstances led Salamancan Thomists like Las Casas uh, to articulate an anthropological outlook that amplified the specifying significance of the use of reason. Now, that amplification was associated with St. Thomas Aquinas. And as an implication, it obscured the place of persons who lacked the use of reason in the thought of both Aristotle and Aquinas. So it's precisely in these 16th century interpretations and applications of Aristotle and Aquinas that we find remnants of an outlook that's been generally displaced from the per, to the periphery of uh, the Thomistic theological tradition. Among the most significant clues to the vestiges of Aquinas' outlook are found in the writings of Francisco de Vitoria in his arguments against the theological and philosophical defenders of the Spanish colonial enterprise. So among the principal targets of the Salamancan Thomist response was the colonialist claim that the conditions of the that the condition of the Mara Indians was an environmentally caused defect of their rational faculties. And the Thomists favored this point of rebuttal because the rationality of the Mara Indian peoples could be demonstrated empirically. And because it relied on Mara's exegetically imprecise conflation of all those categories from Aristotle. Now in doing so, the, the Dominicans tended to avoid Aquinas' association of the accidental condition of those who lack the use of reason with the accidental condition of non-Greeks. So why did they do that? Why did they avoid that association? Well, you can, we can put ourselves in their shoes. If, if one presumes as fact John Mayer's 16th century take on Aristotle, on the essential inferiority of non-Greek foreigners, if you take that as fact, it's difficult to recognize the positive aim of Aquinas' association of barbarism with those who lack the use of reason. And this kind of makes sense. Sometimes it's not a good idea to argue off-topic subtleties when faced with an urgent circumstance and, and, and an opponent who might be eager to twist subtleties into nonsense. So during the 1520s and 1530s, the lines of disputation, they, they radicalized the Salamancan position in a way that obscured Aquinas' theologically subversive revision of Aristotle's natural slave figure. Now, one noteworthy exception, exception among the Salamancan Thomas defense was Francisco de Vitoria. He recognized and appropriated Aquinas' interpretation of book one of Aristotle's politics. So he does this in two places. Uh, the first is his uh, Vittoria's Relectio de Eo ad Quanitere Homo Venens ad Usum Rationis, uh, what is expected of the human being upon arriving at the use of reason. And then in Vittoria's other text, De Indies, um, on the, uh, the Amer Indians. So it, in that first text, the 1534 text, uh, Relectio de Eo Quatenitur, um, the Vittoria's Relectio, it outlines a moral psychology relevant to understanding key parts of his argument in the Indies, especially the controversial and somewhat mysterious eighth title. Now, among the most important aspects of the argument found in De Eo Quatenitur is that Vittoria never entertains uh, the kind of anthropological questions that characterize Aristotle's account of the natural slave and the Spanish colonialist accounts of the Amerindian Indian peoples. Specifically, following Aquinas, Vittoria presumes that those who lack the use of reason are intellectual creatures formed in the image of God and are capable of progressing toward perfection in knowledge and love of God. Also, in that relectio, we find a marker in the 16th century of Aquinas' 13th century 
concerned to provide an account of human dignity and human happiness that takes for granted the fact that sometimes we human beings, we lack the use of reason. Now, among the most important interpretive points relevant to the 16th century Spanish colonial debates are at least three claims. First, Vitoria's Aquinas-inspired view that the intellectual nature of the human being is not identical to having the use of reason. Second, Vitoria's Aquinas-inspired view that the intellectual acts of the human being proper to our created nature, that these aren't re reducible to the use of reason. Third, Vitoria's Aquinas-inspired view that those pre-rational intellectual acts, that these can be perfected by grace, engendering a properly human contemplative happiness in the life of those who lack the use of reason. Now, just as a reminder between uh, for, uh, about the distinction I made in the beginning between the topic of the Spanish colonial debates and the larger subject of the cl Spanish colonial debates. My interest is in the larger subject, reflection, contemplation, argument about the anthropological status and moral aptitude of people who actually and not allegedly lack the use of reason. So in 1537, Pope Paul II promulgated the bull uh, Sublimus Deus. Uh, basically, it was a, a document affirming the full humanity of the Amerindian peoples, that they could receive Christ. And, the, and uh, Pope, uh, Pope Paul II stipulated that in evangelistic intent and merciful regard should characterize all Catholic engagement with the Amerindian peoples. So following in the wake of that formal declaration, and Vittoria wrote his treatise De Indies in 1539, where among, the, uh, among other things, he defends the legitimacy of baptizing the American Indian converts to Christianity, and he argues against the attribution of natural slavery to the American Indian peoples. Now, there's an important element here about that text, De Indies. Uh, De Indies is organized around the presentation of seven Spanish colonialist claims, each one followed by a rebuttal. And there's, so there's a one to one, one to one, one to one. However, it concludes with a discussion of one final Spanish colonialist claim, which is left unanswered. It's the so-called eighth title. And in, in that last final section, Vitoria engages the topic of natural slavery in relationship to the condition amentia. What does he do? Here's what he does. He starts with a disclaimer. That, uh, that what follows it, it, uh, is an argument that he does not affirm, but cannot entirely reject. And Vittoria outlines of the view that he presents as the only possible justification for the Spanish colonial presence in the Americas. Namely, if all the Amer Indians are amentis, if they are the slave by nature as described by Aristotle, then according to Vittoria, that would be the most appropriate uh, it would be most appropriate for them to be ruled by people who could provide guidance and protective care. So there's a contemporary mystery, an, in, an interpretive disagreement about what exactly Vittoria was arguing for in that eighth title. Now, the, the disagreement, the mystery settles into four basic possibilities. First, some suppose that Vittoria was simply being a thorough scholar, but, uh, but didn't believe the argument. The second typical option is some suppose that Vittoria included the argument to appease the colonial ambitions of Charles V. Uh, basically, because it's left without a rebuttal, it leaves it open for use in Spanish legal arguments. A third possible interpretation was that some speculate that Vittoria secretly held a low opinion of the Amerindians. A fourth possibility, some contend that Vittoria was forced to concede the rhetorical point to the Spanish colonialists because Vitoria somehow, some way believed the reports about the irrational, brutish status of the Amerindian peoples. The contemporary mystery centers on why Vitoria would concede this as a legitimate title. After presenting and, ex and, and accepting at great length all the hard evidence demonstrating the rational status of the Amerindian peoples. So there are Four presumptions behind the contemporary interpretive muddle, contemporary interpretive challenge. Here are those four presumptions. First is presumed that when Vittoria refers to Aristotle's natural slave, he has in mind John Mayer's formulation and gloss of book one of the politics. 
Second is presumed that Victoria regarded human nature and the human good and our contemplative aptitude to hinge on the capacity for the use of reason. And third is typically presumed that for Victoria and maybe Thomism, that the conditions of Amentius are somehow inconsistent with human nature or that the condition of Amentia is a perversion of human nature. And finally, it's presumed with respect to the differences of competencies of our rational faculties, it's presumed that for Vittoria, a relationship of competency and dependency between two adults, one who has the full use of reason and one who actually has an, an impairment, that that would be unnatural. So against those contemporary presumptions, I would say that there's a case to be made that the actual contention of Victoria's eighth title becomes clear when all the historical and, and exegetical work that I outlined previously is taken to, into account. Specifically, Aristotle's actual understanding of the condition of the natural slave, Aquinas's understanding of those who lack the use of reason that's unpacked throughout the Summa, uh, his Summa Contra, Contra Gentiles and, and Damalo, Aquinas's subversion of Aristotle's account of the essential defect uh, of the natural slave, and the novelty, the actual historical novelty of Mayer's interpretive gloss of Book One of the Politics. In other words, and here's the significant part, Vittoria presents and develops Aquinas' understanding of the merciful regard that is due to persons who lack the use of reason. In doing so, Vittoria presumes the inalienable intellectual status and contemplative aptitude of those who lack the use of reason. On that basis, when Vittoria associates the condition of Amentia with Aristotle's natural slave, he is in fact outlining that the only possible case in which the Spanish presence in the Americas could be legitimate, namely, if there was some unfathomable circumstance where the rational faculties of a large part of some population were found to be impaired which was emphatically not the case with the Amerindian peoples, as Vittoria and the Dominicans of Salamanca forcefully demonstrated. But here's what's important. Vittoria pauses. He takes the time to argue a slightly off-topic subtlety amid an urgent circumstance for the sake of persons who are easy to ignore because they are easy to forget. In other words, having decisively demonstrated that the Amera Indian peoples do not suffer from a pop population scale congenital impairment of their rational faculties, Vittoria remembers that there are still some human beings who lack the use of reason. Vittoria remembers that when, pers that when persons are found to lack the use of reason, as with cognitive impairment or intellectual disability, uh, that the precepts of mercy oblige Christians to offer guidance, care, protection, and comfort. Moreover, as Vittoria argues, uh, makes his argument in defense of the rational status and moral aptitude of the Amerindian indian peoples, he remembers that although the use of reason manifests our intellectual dignity, our creaturely dignity is not founded upon the use of reason. It's founded upon our ability to know and love our creator. Now, despite the arguments of Vittoria and his extension of Aquinas' way of thinking about those who lack the use of reason, his remarks in the eighth title of De Indies reflect an outlook that has been largely displaced from the standard mores of the Thomistic theological tradition. Amid the various engagements and disputes about the justice of the Spanish colonial enterprise in the Americas, a consensus emerged that the use of reason is what specifies the human being. And that the perfection of human nature, human flourishing, is defined by rationality as a formal principle. Now, there was nothing wholly new about that 16th century consensus, um, because it, it reflects the common scholastic presumption that a for formal cause and the final cause are mutually implicating. What was different, the notion that was displaced, was Aquinas' distinction between the specifying act of the intellect and the use of reason and Aquinas' particular way of understanding the secondary perfection and final perfection of our intellectual nature in contemplation. So in conclusion, to wrap this up, there's one final part of this of this story which I'm not going to tell here. Uh, it's a much bigger part. Um, it has to do with the debate at Valladolid in 1550 between Juan Guinness de Sepúlveda and Bartolome de las Casas. 
In brief, Sepulveda presents Mayer's theory of natural slavery, and he claimed the support of Aquinas and Vitoria. Now, in that debate, Las Casas rightly rejects Sepulveda's claims about the rational faculties and moral aptitude of the Amerindian peoples. But there was one important outcome of the debate. And in particular, it was the wide distribution throughout Europe of Las Casas's account of the debate. Now, one could speculate that Las Casas inadvertently promulgated John Mayer's interpretation of Aristotle and John Mayer's formulation of the natural slave theory, and in particular, Sepulveda's development of Mayer and use of Aquinas. If that's the case, we could also speculate that the 17th and 18th century body of literature identified under the, under the heading, The Black Legend, popularized Sepulveda's readings of Aristotle and Aquinas, which were not directly contested by Las Casas in his defense of the Indians. The claim that the American Indian peoples were natural slaves was, of course, universally recognized as false and ultimately rejected in the Spanish Catholic world by the end of the 17th century. Nevertheless, it's reasonable to surmise that the contemporary widespread presumption that Aquinas has a negative view of persons who lack the use of reason has its origin in that black legend. Exemplified in the efforts of Las Casas, the Salamancan defense favored formulations geared to oppose colonialist arguments that question the rational status of the American Indian peoples. The result was a spectrum of quasi-rationalistic contentions concerning human, human nature and the human good, which were attributed to Aquinas. In that way, uh, now it, in that way, it was understandable. But rhetorical expedience and an urgent circumstance led well-intentioned figures like Las Casas to gloss over distinctions that were integral to Aquinas' theological understanding of persons who lacked the use of reason. Now, knowing this history, we today have the opportunity to recover something that may have been lost. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel. First of all, I wanna thank everybody for sticking with La Familia, with our family, our Lumen Christi family tonight. We apologize for the difficulties with pinning the dual speakers. And I wanna thank Miguel. I mean, I promised to show, I promised that you would show the interweaving and entanglements of the Catholic intellectual tradition. And I think you fulfilled that promise beautifully, brilliantly. So we can go straight to questions. There were two questions of clarification regarding terms in Aristotle from uh, Dr. Michael Waddell and Dr. Teresa Zollner. If you're uh, in agreement, Miguel, I'm gonna ask them both to speak and see if you might wanna respond to both of them at once. Is that okay? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll do my best on the fly. It's always hard to do exegesis uh, uh, in this setting, but I'll, I'll do my best. Teresa? Hi, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, I can hear you. Hi, sorry, uh, I don't have video. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Romero, for your, your important talk. Um, I think that the question that um, was being referred to is when I said that the, there's a, there are some terms in Greek. One is noose um, that captures better the sort of specifying act of the intellect and Eastern Christians took the term noose from Greek philosophy and started talking about it as the seeing eye of the soul. And it, it's not the same as reasoning, as you point out, you know. And so the, those terms, noose, psyche, pneuma from Greek sort of easily show the difference between uh, what you're talking about. And when, when, when those terms get translated into English, uh, it makes it even worse because in English, everything's referred to as basically the mind or the intellect. And nobody really knows what that means because in Greek, there are these specific terms. So you might, I invite you to comment on that. Well, uh, uh, there's a couple of directions I could get into that. Let me, let me just take this one, uh, this one line. Um, the reason why I think uh, that comment on uh, those different formulations of uh, uh, at least on Aristotle's term with the Greek philosophy of, of, about mind, thinking, understanding, knowledge. Uh, that's important when we are trying to think carefully about the fact that sometimes people 
uh, lack the use of reason or cognitively impaired or have what we call today an intellectual disability. If we're trying to think about that seriously, I think uh, we oftentimes project um, a best case anthropology onto historical figures. Um, what I am contending is that when we look at someone like Aristotle, uh, and the, the plain sense of the text and his, the, you know, the first uh, from book one of the politics, uh, we can actually see and tease out uh, a reality that we experience today. Um, now, there are a lot of ways to try and make sense of what he's saying. And like, uh, I think there are at least kind of three tacks you can have on what he means, like this act, what is the actual problem with, uh, um, uh, with uh, the natural slave figure, the Vosil Luan figure. Uh, uh, but I, the big takeaway that I would I would advocate is that there is a concrete, practical, living, ordinary reality that he was pointing towards. He was woefully wrong, I would say. Um, however, I think there is a value in paying attention to that in Aristotle, especially when we wanted when we're talking about interpretations of interpretations of interpretations of interpretations. There's something worth recovering there. We did well, not invent disability. Uh, or theological consideration of disability in the 20th century. It's well, if I could, if I could just follow up. Um, yeah. Can I can I have a follow? Just, uh, what you're saying is extremely important, and the reason I say that is that you know there's been a history in in the Americas and in fact around the world of seeing indigenous people as kind of like flora and fauna, right, mm -hmm. and not having rationality and human dignity as made in the image and likeness of God. And what I would say is that that thing that you're talking about, that sort of real and practical thing, it actually still exists today. Um, I'm a psychologist, I do assessment. M many years ago, my doctoral dissertation was focused on how intellectual assessment and other types of assessment in psychology are actually biased in terms of um, when they're done with, with uh, indigenous peoples, you know. And so what you're saying today, although it sounds like a historical discussion, are this, these are actually the roots of a contemporary problem that we have when we work in healthcare and in other ways with Indigenous people. So it's, it's, it, it started way back, but it's actually a current problem. And we have to remember that things like residential schools only closed most recently in, in at least up here in Canada in like 1996. So it wasn't very long ago, right? Um, so these, these arguments that you're bringing up, although we can talk about them as historical arguments, they're contemporary problems. So I, 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 I just wanna honor you and tell you how important it is that you're, you're bringing attention to that because these are current problems, not historical problems. Thank you, I, I, I agree. Uh, I, I agree that uh, and part of addressing the contemporary horizon is attending to history and his, the way historical ideas have been shaped and formed. Thank Here. you, Dr. Zollner. So uh, Dr. Michael Waddell had a series of questions. Would you like to just pick one uh, to pose to Miguel? Yes, of course. Thank you, Peter. Um, Miguel, excellent, um, excellent paper as always. Um, just really fascinating material. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you just if you would clarify for me um, what you mean by the term essential defect. I think when you were talking about Aristotle's discussion of the so-called natural slave, you, you talked about it as a person as an essential defect. And, and what's motivating my question is this, um, understanding um, the human soul as a specific form, that is to say a form that makes us to be a member of a particular species, and the ratio of that species is rational animal, it wouldn't seem to be possible on an Aristotelian account to have a member of the human species who lacks rationality, that is to say, who lacks the faculty of reason as distinct from the use of reason. Um, if, if, if you would agree with that, um, that, under, that understanding of, of the specific form of rational animal, um, then I'm, I'm curious um, if you could help me to understand what you mean when you say that there's an essential defect. It doesn't seem like it could be a defect in terms of the possession of a faculty that's essential to a member of this species. Um, so, so if it's not that, then, then, then could you help me to understand what it is? Awesome. Thank you, Michael. First of all, it's, it's good to hear your voice. I don't think we've spoken for years. Um, uh, so to answer your question, uh, uh, so the, uh, the quick answer is uh, I write about this and I talk about this in the 
article in the chapter that this talk is based on. Um, here's the uh, here's maybe a quick line to uh, to unpack what you accurately point towards. Um, so uh, so uh, within Aristotle, there's there's the eidos, the form, the ergon, the function, and the telos. When he's uh, um, the challenge is when there's a failure of the ergon, the function of a particular being in question. Now. There's this interesting line that Aristotle develops. Uh, certain, it's, it's in the Nicomachean Ethics, it's in the politics, but it also comes up in his metaphysics and some other places on uh, where it gives a reference to nature's intent. Now, there's this phrase, nature's intent is applied to two, uh, two uh, classes of human beings, uh, uh, women uh, or, or uh, female human beings and the fusidu lawn figure, the natural slave. Now, by associating them, he describes them both as defective in slightly different ways, according to Aristotle. Uh, women are misbegotten males, uh, but they're according to Aristotle, uh, that's, that's the case according to nature's intent for the continuance of the species. Now he makes the same sort of claim about the Fossi du Lan figure, that there is a, a particular kind of lack that's according to nature's intent for the continuance of the species. So you can have these relationships of competency and dependency. Now, by framing it as a natural defect, according to Aristotle, there's they're still humans. That's unambiguous. They're still human beings. Now, what there's some there's a particular kind of function that's not actualized. Uh, now, so the way to tease that out. Now, I'm, I'm, you can see that I'm kind of putting a little bit of uh, I'm dabbing a little bit of Aquinas onto Aristotle there in the in how I'm interpreting uh, Aristotle's moves. Um, uh, I think there's a textual question to be unpacked. No matter what, uh, there is something that is uh, not actualized that is proper to the form uh, of the eidos of, of the human being that doesn't it doesn't it's not it doesn't come to bear in the case of women and the Fusi du Lawn figure for Aristotle. So what is that? How do we make sense of that? The the word I put to it or the I've described it as an essential defect. Um, uh, uh, there's a particular kind of ergon that doesn't unfold from the eidos of the human being on Aristotle's terms. However, uh, uh, the person who's helped me think about this the most is would be Stephen Stephen Clark, uh, his book Aristotle's Man. I think it's an under underappreciated systematic reading of a quinet of Aristotle on these kinds of themes. Um, but I am also a student on this. This is a uh, uh, I have a lot to learn, and I'm just trying to put out an understanding of how Aquinas interpreted Aristotle, because I think that's the key part. Um, uh, Aquinas' interpretation of Aristotle, that's the thing I'm really after. Um, uh, what Aristotle actually said and actually is the case, uh, that's an exegetical question. I'm just interested in opening up the possibilities of this line of interpretation of Aristotle, which is shared by Trevor Saunders, uh, G. Scott uh, Davis, um, and Stephen Clark, for example. And so I, I hope I answered your question. I basically kind of dodged it, uh, but I do talk about this in the in the book chapter. Thank you, Michael. Miguel, there's a series of questions about the colonial period. Um, Linda Jenkins asked about the doctrine of discovery. Marilyn Bousset asked about whether the misinterpretations are, were used to rationalize the enslavement of Africans. But if I could ask you to focus on this one from Jose Espericueta, um, he asks, whether uh, what was particular to Sepulveda's reading that allowed him to argue for irrationality? Uh, okay, so here's what I think about Sepulveda. I think uh, so. This is my, my this is my take on on Democratus Alter. Uh, I think Sepulveda was a very consistent and faithful interpreter of Aristotle, with one slight twist: is he uh, he he was sympathetic to uh, uh, the way the Spanish colonialists appropriated uh, the descriptions of the Amerindian peoples and the um, uh, 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 and, and made use of mirrors formulation. So uh, when it comes to Sepulveda, uh, I, think, uh, I think part of the challenge in that dialogue in Democratus Alter, it, it, he 
his line is basically he's advancing an Aristotelian account on the presumption that uh, the American peoples do in fact lack the use of reason, that there's some kind of congenital impairment that's climate caused. Um, I think that's what's going on with Seporoda, but he doesn't develop it like systematically. I mean, he develops in, term, in terms of narrative and dialogue and kind of injects the claims into the, into the conversation between the two, the, the, the handful of figures. Um, uh, so that's what I would say is going on with uh, with Sepulveda. Now, with the problem, the challenge I think here is that is Las Casas's response. Uh, like, I, the servant of God, Bartolome de Las Casas. I mean, this guy, he 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 mounted his defense, and he, there was a couple points where he played fast and loose with some distinctions that, in the moment, didn't weren't the most important thing. But as he made his argument, he did forget about folks who lack the use of reason. And because of that, he, uh, he played a little bit fast and loose with some distinctions that today are very important. Um, well, I mean, they never stopped being important. I think it was because of that conversation that we lost a part of the tradition where now we have a challenge as Thomists uh, recovering Aquinas' way of thinking on these themes. So finally, Miguel, uh, Elise Abshire has a very nice question that many people ask about people with disability. It, asks, it goes a little bit beyond your presentation, but I'm going to ask her to be recognized so she can pose it. Hi, Dr. Mara. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Elise. Hi. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was great. Um, and I think you know that I'm really thankful for your contribution to Catholic disability studies. So thank you also. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify, you mentioned defect on Christ's body, um, which Aquinas also mentions in his question um, on Christ's risen body, and he mentions these pulling from Bede as trophies of his victory for his glory. Um, so given the example of Christ and his risen body, so he retains his wounds, although we don't think of them as wounds, I was wondering what this means for the resurrection um, of the risen bodies of persons with cognitive impairment? And do you think that these persons will retain any wounds from their disability on their risen bodies in heaven? Um, so uh, uh, thank you for that question, Elise. Um, so there's a, a I wanna, it's a, it's a Thomas, you, I wanna make some distinctions. There's, uh, there's my best take on how Aquinas would answer that. So that's an that's a interpretive question. Uh, and then there's uh, what I take to be uh, the the, uh, uh, the teachings of the church, uh, which uh, don't uh, which are more expansive than Aquinas. Aquinas was pointing to the the faith of the church, um, but Aquinas does provide descriptions that I think are useful. So uh, okay, so here's the honest answer: I I, I don't know um, uh, what is to come, uh, but we have hope that all things will be reconciled through God in Christ. And the clearest and most decisive picture we have in the tradition from the sources of the church, the source of our faith, is the resurrection wounds of Christ, these glorified wounds. And so then we could ask the question, what would it mean for our the wounds we share in this life for them to be glorified, especially reading and thinking with Pope John Paul II, um, if uh, one's wounds, uh, impairments, illnesses, and, and injuries are um, are, are bound to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, complete Christ's suffering, as it says in Colossians. And that's what Pope John Paul II refers to. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, uh, Deves and Misericordia, um, so, uh, 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 rich in suffering. Um, I'm sorry, rich in mercy. I'm sorry, I'm not, I meant to say salvation and loris, as uh, 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 salvation and suffering. Um, what, is it, what would it look like for the wounds of someone with a profound and utterly debilitating intellectual disability for those wounds to be glorified? My goodness, I don't know, but as a Christian, I hope. Um, and we can imagine, and I think St. Thomas Aquinas provides um, a picture of that. Um, uh, I don't think uh, things will be forgotten, and I, but I do think things will be redressed, that things will be reconciled, that our weaknesses will be perfected. <laughs> And even our wounds in this life, uh, our, our stutters and stumblings and clumsiness in this life of all sorts, that these will be redeemed and glorified in a way that we can't imagine, but it will be perfect. That's my hope as, as a Christian. Um, so that's a long way to say, I don't know, but I hope. 
I believe in the resurrection, bodily resurrection of the dead. We're saved by hope. Thank you for that question, Elise. And for those of you whose questions I wasn't allowed to, uh, to allow voice, I apologize for that. I just want to end with two, two words of gratitude. First, to our heroic and very patient translators, uh, Nancy Sullivan and Jenna Jacek. Thank you so very much for being with us and for allowing us to extend the family as far as we can. And then finally, to our speaker tonight, Dr. Miguel Romero, uh, you've, you've brought your own Chicano insights on the Catholic intellectual tradition and shown us how complex and mysterious and wonderful it is. So I just wanna thank you so much for that. Please join me in, in thanking Dr. Romero for this wonderful presentation. And with that, I'll turn it back to Michael. Um, indeed, uh, on behalf of our audience and on behalf of the Lewin Christie Institute, I want to extend my gratitude to Miguel for a fantastic conversation. Uh, Peter for not only doing a great job as always moderating, um, but also helping to plan this whole series. And to our two special guests today, Jenna Yasek and Nancy Sullivan, our expert ASL interpreters. Um, but also we want to thank you for joining us today. Um, and if you enjoyed today's talk, uh, you will receive an email tomorrow that has a link to the YouTube stream of it, and you can share it on with others who are unable to participate. Um, as I mentioned, word of mouth and the recommendation of others continues to be the best way to invite others to go deeper into the Catholic intellectual tradition. Um, you can register today for the next installment of this Hispanic theological series on May 4th with Claudia Herrera and Jose Mas Matos Alfon on Latino youth and evangelization. Um, once more, something that I would probably share onwards with your parishes, um, with your priests, uh, with your friends. Join our mailing list today and stay tuned for future programs. This series was made possible by a generous grant from the Our Sunday Visitor Institute and is co-sponsored by Actus, La Comunidad of Hispanic Scholars of Religion, Corazon Piro, the Collegium Institute, the Hispanic Theological Initiative, St. Benedict Institute, the Nova Forum, Calvert House Catholic Ministry, Dominican University Ministry Program, the Ecclesia Amer in America Network, the Hank Center for Catholic Intellectual Heritage, the Oscar Romero Scholars Program at Catholic Theological Union, ISCALI, Commonweal Magazine, America Media, and especially today we are grateful for the National Catholic Partnership on Disability um, for co-sponsoring. Um, thank you so much to all of our co-sponsors for helping to ensure the success of today's event. Finally, I invite you to support us. Once more, help get word out to your friends and parishes, follow us on social media and share our materials. And finally, become a financial sponsor today of our work at www.luminchristi.org slash donate. A gift of any kind goes a long way. Once more, thank you to um, all of those who pl play a role in the success of today's event, especially Dr. Miguel Romero. And we look forward to welcoming you all back same time, same place next week.